thanks for joining us here today at Victory Church, where we invite people to belong before they believe. If you want to know more about who we are and what we do, or if any of our messages have impacted your life and you would like to partner with us in giving to this ministry, we invite you to do so by visiting our website at victory.church. Now, let's check out this week's message. Stop it. You guys are awesome. Hey, can we just do something really quick? We are, you know, Pastor John's on a much needed vacation, but I'm so grateful for his leadership in this house, the wisdom, the words he brings to this house. Can we just honor Pastor John? He's gonna be watching this back. We love you. I'm grateful for you and uh, honored to, to bring the word today. Also, I wanna welcome our Edmond campus. Help me in welcoming our Edmond campus today. Edmond, I miss you. I love you. For those of you at the Grapevine campus, I was the campus pastor for many years at the Edmond campus, but we've transitioned that to Pastor Cameron. And Pastor Cameron, you're doing an incredible job. I'm so grateful for you and uh, excited about all the things I'm hearing. Can we just uh, give Cameron a, a big hand and thank him for what he's doing? And he's leading that campus very, very well, and we're so grateful for him. So I've been praying for this this week. This, if I'm honest, will be a bit of a heavy message today. Um, and I've been feeling the weight. So as, as pastors, there's times that before we're preaching, the Lord allows us to experience a little bit of what we're gonna preach about. And other times, he allows you to feel the weight of the people that you're about to preach to. And I've been feeling that. This entire week, if I'm gonna be trying not to be too emotional during this message, I've been feeling the heaviness that some of you feel. I've been feeling the anxiety that maybe you walked in with tonight. I've been feeling the depression that, that's so prevalent in our, our world today. It's very easy to just get on the news or get on Facebook or social media or Instagram and, and see this world is going a very difficult, to a very difficult place. I'm thankful that regardless, that God sits on the throne, aren't you? Yes. But it doesn't at times make it easier. It doesn't mean that just because God sits on the throne that, that things go just as we planned. In fact, how many of us would be honest enough to say, at times things go completely different than I had planned my life? In fact, I was looking through some statistics and I don't even know, these may not even be fully accurate because uh, many of these were, some of these were pre-2020 and there's been, there's counselors in this room that know since 2020, there's been a rush or a surge of anxiety and depression in our world. But this says this, depression is the leading cause of disability in the US ages 15 to 44 affecting more than 15 million people in a given year. Anxiety disorder, uh, disorders are the most common mental illness in the US, affecting 40 million adults in ages, uh, in the United States ages 18 and older, or that's 18, listen to this, 18% of the population. Young adults ages 18 to 25 years have the highest prevalence of major depressive episodes. And so what I want you to know is if you walked in with that, maybe to everybody else it looks great. Maybe you've been kind of keeping your, your head up, trying to stay above water and you've been pushing through, but you walked in this evening and you know that things are tough. Or this morning in Edmond, as you walk in, to, maybe, maybe you're dealing with something very difficult right now in your life, I want you to know this, there's hope. In fact, I love this scripture and this is what I've been praying over you. Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow. I want everybody at all the campuses to say overflow that you may overflow with hope by the power 
of the Holy Spirit, not on your own, not because of your circumstances, not because things are getting better, simply because there is a God in heaven who sits on the throne, who loves you and sees right where you're at, and he's given you the Holy Spirit so that you can be comforted and that you can find hope. Can we just give God a round of applause for that and thank him for who he is? But it can be difficult, and I'm, I'm, gonna be, I'm gonna be vulnerable today. I'm gonna share with this campus, for the very first time, a story in my life that's been a challenge my entire life. Edmund shared this six years ago. So some of you are new and you don't know it. Maybe for some of you, you haven't heard it in a while, and I hope even if you've heard it before, I pray that it brings you hope today. But what I wanna talk about today is, and this is the title of the message, Breakthrough After, bre after Breakdown. Anybody experienced a breakdown before in their life? Some breakdowns are minor, not, not big breakdowns. Other times in our lives we face these big breakdowns, but if you walked in hopeless, or you walked in with depression, or there's just a little bit of anxiety, I wanna pray that there's hope that you leave with today. You just put your hands out in a posture receiving. I wanna pray for you. And before I pray, what I want you to do, if you walked in with anxiety, you walked in with fear, you walked in with depression, before I even pray, I want you to ask the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, to bring you comfort. Just tell him. Holy Spirit, would you comfort us? Holy Spirit, would you bring us peace? As your word says, Lord, that you give us a peace that passes all understanding. So even though we don't understand how we have it, would you give it to us, Lord? And I pray at the Eben campus and Grapevine online and those that watch this later, Father, I pray that you would bring peace where there's pain, joy, where there's hurt. Father, we would leave here after this message different in Jesus' name and everybody said, amen. Breakthrough can come after breakdown. And breakdown doesn't have to be a bad thing. In fact, there's three things that I believe if we'll allow it to and we'll allow the breakdown to do in our life, I think there's three things that we can see that the Lord can use this. I don't believe the Lord ever causes it, but I'm grateful that God does not waste anything. He's not a wasteful God. And what you've gone through, the challenges you face, the things that's in front of you, he can use it. So the first point, Today is this, breakdown causes us to lay it down. Ever been there before? Some of you, you may find yourself right there in this very moment, but breakdown, if we'll allow it to, it causes us to lay some things down that we are not called to carry in the very first place. Psalm 34, 19 says, many are the afflictions of the righteous but the Lord delivers them from them all. That's the righteous. You know, there's a theology out there that once you commit your life to Christ, everything's just perfect. I have found it to be the opposite. Here it says the righteous. Who are the righteous? The righteous are those of us in the room or in Edmond today that have committed our life to Christ. The righteous, so I should encourage you today, okay? That if you're facing some, some tribulation, if you're facing some affliction, that you're not alone. Everybody that we see that had great faith in the Bible walked through times of affliction. In fact, Paul's one of those in 2 Corinthians. This is one of my verses I've stood on in my life. 2 Corinthians 12, eight through 10, he says this. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away. Now, there's theologians will kind of debate. There's a lot of different thoughts on what was bothering Paul, but many agree that it was a physical ailment. Something physically was bothering him. It could have been mental, it could have been emotional, but it's likely that it was physical. And here's what he says, but he said to me, now most of the time, hold on, hold on for a second. Most of the time when we pray something like that, we want God to just take it away. Anybody like me? I like hot pocket prayer. I like it when when I pray and I see it happen, and I've had those moments, right? I've had the moments where God, but I'm telling you more times than not, there's been a process to my prayers. And so he says, 
Three times I pleaded for the Lord to take it away, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. This is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. What I've noticed in my life is that breakdown removes our control. And in, if we're honest in this in here today or at Edmond, how many of us would, would be honest enough to say, I'm a bit of a control freak? Maybe I should ask your spouse. There'd be a lot more hands. As humans, we love control. We want to have control over everything. We want to make sure that everything's going to be exactly the way that we want. But who's raised teenagers before? Just raise a 13 to 18 year old and you'll find out real quickly you have limited control in this life, if not any at all. The truth is we're not called to have control. Control is not something that you and I are supposed to have. In fact, what we do is, and the way that we try to control things oftentimes, and we may not see it this way, but, but worry is our attempt to control. How many are like me, like you do your best worrying right before you're supposed to go to sleep? Anybody like me? I can, I'm telling you, I can play every scenario out in my mind of way things are gonna go, and, and it's very rare that when I'm in that mode, that I'm, I'm planning out something good happening. We like to go to the worst case scenarios, right? I went, I went to a counselor years ago, and uh, I, I did like five or six sessions. And I don't, I don't remember anything from any of the sessions except the second time I was there. I'm sitting with him, and uh, I'm talking with him, and and it was obvious to him that I'd been worrying and I'd been stressing over some things. And he said to me, he said, you know, you worry because you think you need to. I thought to myself, well, I don't think I need to worry. He said, yeah, you, you think you need to. You think it's good for you. You actually think that by worrying you can control it. And that has stuck with me that worry is our exhausting attempt to control the outcome of our situation. It says this in scripture, you know this, but let's read it. In Matthew 6, 25 through 27, it says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body or what you will wear. Is it not more than, um, is it not, is it not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air, they do not, sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet their heavenly Father feeds them. And are you not much more valuable than they can? And I love this line in 27, verse 27. Let this sink in. Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? I would argue this. The worry can't add a single hour to your life, but it can take years away from your life. It can steal the joy in the present. It can actually make you sick. Worry can rot your bones and it can do some things within your body because we are not called to worry. We're not supposed to worry. Worry is something that we're supposed to give to the Lord and yet we hold on to it because it's our attempt to control our situation. And then I love this. So he, in Matthew, that 6, 25 to 27, it goes on to, Give some more similar imagery, and then in verse 33, it says this. It says, but first, seek the Lord and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, and this is so true, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough troubles of its own. If you know that to be true, can I get an amen? amen. Tomorrow has enough troubles of its own, but my worry that at times, and I've gotten better over the years. But at night, I saw this quote, and, and it really spoke to me. It says, never doubt 
This is Raymond Edmond, I don't even know who he is, but I love this quote, it says this, never doubt in the dark what God has told you in the light. And the reason why many times that we get to that, that point in our life, especially at, at night before we're going to bed, is we're tired, we're exhausted, and I'm just telling you, that's when the enemy sees you. When you're in a season of tired, and you're exhausted, and you're worn out, and maybe you find yourself there, maybe you've been struggling, maybe life has been tough, maybe you're raising children, and you're just tired, or maybe your job, or you're a business owner, and things are just difficult in this economy, and you find yourself tired, that is when the enemy will come and that's when the worry begins. But the question becomes, how are we gonna even out an hour? What's even the purpose in our worry? The truth is this, worry should be a trigger to lay it down. This is what it's become for me. The minute I worry, I want that to be a filter for me to say, Lord, there's obviously something that's on my mind. You know what it says in scripture? It says he perfects that which concerns us. And so there's a point in our life where we have to say this, I'm about to worry about this or I am worrying about this. And so Lord, I'm gonna use this as a filter or a trigger that I'm just gonna begin to lay it down. And so Lord, right now, I lay down my marriage. Some of you are gonna have to say this right now. I, I lay down my marriage to you, Lord. I lay down my children to you, Lord. I lay down my finances to you, God. Lord, I lay down my ministry. I lay down my desires. I lay down my future. And you know what you're doing when you lay it down is you're giving it to someone who can handle it a whole lot better than you can to begin with. And when you're struggling and when you're frustrated and when you're worrying, if you'll just say, God, I'll lay it down, I'm telling you, you'll get the peace in Philippians that it talks about that passes all understanding. And you may not know how this is gonna go, but at the end of the day, you can give it to someone who holds the control. So the first thing is this, is it causes us to lay it down. The second thought is this, is breakdown prepares us for breakthrough that there's something that God wants to do inside of us. Breakdown has a way of developing us in ways that nothing else can. It has a way of revealing things to us in a way that nothing else can. In fact, in Romans 5, 3 through 4, it says this, not only, it says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. We don't preach about that a lot, do we? Because we know that suffering produces what? Perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, say it with me, hope. It actually produces hope. Worry and anxiety is rooted in, it's rooted in fear. Fear always looks back, right? Fear looks to what, the way things have always been or the way that things have always gone or the way that something else turned out. Hope always points us to the future. Hope always says, it may have turned out that way at that time, but I've got a better plan or a, a different picture for you. Or I was doing something in that season that's developing something in you because I've got something for you to carry in the future. But without going through some, some difficulty, you're not ready for it. In fact, in Romans, um, uh, uh, in James 1 through 2, this is my least favorite scripture in all the, is it okay to say you have a least favorite scripture? <laughs> Anybody have a least favorite scripture? It might be this one. James 1, 2 through 4, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. Don't you love it? Because you know that the testing, say testing, of your faith produces, say produces. There it is, that word again, perseverance. So let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature, say mature, complete, not lacking anything. I used to pray and want God to take things away and that's kind of shifted in my life. God's not necessarily concerned about your miracle, he's, he's concerned about your maturity. Sometimes he brings the miracle instantly. And other times 
He begins to do a deep work in you because he's got something for you that you will not be able to handle unless you go through some things. And this has been my story. Because maturity is a process. It requires some things. How many know the story of Sarah and Abraham? Lord comes to Abraham and says, I'm gonna give you a child. And, and that's, in verse, that's in Genesis 12. Okay, so Abraham at this time, when he gets this word from the Lord, he's 75 years old. Now that's already weird enough. <laughs> you can have a child at 75, but, but then there begins a process. It's not until chapter 21 in verse five, when Abraham, it says this, Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. 25 years, from 75 to 100. I get tired of it when it's lasting a month when I'm praying for it. The Lord wants to know, can you trust me in the wait? Can you trust me in the process? Can you, will you, will you allow me to, to work on you and do some things within you because I have something great for you? He had, listen, he had a great plan for Abraham and the, the, the plan wasn't just Isaac. This is the key. The plan was much bigger than that. The plan was he was gonna make him the father of what? Many nations. You think Abraham could have handled that? He needed 25, listen, he needed 25 years of going through some things, making some mistakes. We know all the mistakes that he made. But then it says this, it says this in Romans, and this is what I want you to get today. It says this, Romans 8, 4, 18, it says, against all hope, say against all hope. Against all hope, Abraham in hope. That's confusing, isn't it? believed and so became the father of many nations just as it is, just as it is, uh, had been said to him, so shall be your offsprings. The truth is this, can you carry hope even when it feels hopeless? That's the question I have that I have to ask myself. I'm not pointing at you, this is the question I have to ask myself. Am I gonna allow this world to steal my hope? Am I allow the circumstances that I'm facing? To, there's been circumstances pop up in, in, in with me in the last couple of weeks, and I've had to ask that, that question to me. Am I gonna allow this situation to steal my hope? Or, I, or am I gonna, against all hope, in hope, and not worry and not try to control, but lay it down and give it to the Father and know that he's doing something. He's got a better plan for me to begin with. He's, he, he's doing something. Maybe your breakthrough hasn't come because you've given up hope. And the Lord wants to restore that today. You remember Job, I love the story of Job. Job makes me feel really good about myself. If you're feeling bad today, just go read Job. You'll feel much better. But I love Job's perspective. In chapter 23, eight through 10, he says, but if I go to the east, he is not there. If I go to the west, this is how many of us feel right now. If I go to the west, I do not find him. When he's at work in the north, I do not see him. When he turns to the south, I catch no glimpse of him. But he says this, but he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. Job had the, the awareness to say, I don't see you, Lord. And maybe that's where you find yourself right now. Maybe you find yourself in a season where it just feels difficulty. It just feels difficult. There's difficulty in your life. There's challenge. And, and it, it feels like you look here and you look there and you look there and you look around you and you don't see God. Can I just, can I just encourage you to shift your perspective? That he knows the way that you take. He sees you right where you are in the middle of this mess and at the end of the day, he's doing something in you. Even if he didn't cause this, he will use it because he's not wasteful. And I'm just telling you right now, gold is gonna come out. And you know how gold's tested. We've, you've heard preachers talk about this over and over again. But the thing I want you to realize is this, that sometimes it takes going in and coming out and going in the fire and coming out of the fire and going in the fire and every single time more impurities are being swiped away, more impurities are being removed. And I think what you'll say is this, is what I say, this is, I, I don't ever want this stuff again, but I will go through it all day long if it's purifying me. It's a perspective shift. Job knew the process was to purify him, so he allowed it to do its work. And really, this last point is what I want you to get today. 
And this is where I, I really wanna share something personal. The third point is this, your breakdown leads to someone else's breakthrough. So I've shared this with, over the years a few times, but I, don't, I haven't shared it a lot. I've never shared it here at Grapevine. I've shared it once, like I said, in Edmond uh, a long time ago. But I was born with Tourette syndrome. I told that to Barbara the other day. She was the mom. She goes, I've never noticed, but that's because I've, I've learned how to manage it. So, um, so I was born, you know, when I, when I was, it didn't really become prevalent in my life. I didn't really know I had it until I was about maybe 12 years old. I was in middle school. Because that's when people start to point things out to you. <laughs> middle school are some difficult years. And I remember um, it got really bad because people were pointing out some little ticks that I had. And let me just say this too. Uh, most people associate Tourette's syndrome with the blurting out of curse words. I don't have that. I'm safe with a microphone, okay? <laughs> Pastor John can trust me with a microphone. But the tick that I had was in my face. And I would blink my eyes and I would clench my head. And I was always affirming. People loved me. I was always affirming them. I was always, <laughs> yes, yes, you're, you're great. It came really difficult. And I remember those, it kind of came to a head. I was sitting in, sitting in a seventh grade English class. And my, I was moving and I was just, it was distracting. And I also had a take, I'd tap my pencil. Anybody, any pencil tappers? Come on. Had no idea you had Tourette's Center. I was tapping my pencil and I would, I would also clench things. And so I was clenching this pencil. And it snapped. And half the pencil flew across the classroom and hit somebody and my te the teacher didn't, they didn't, at this time, they didn't know a whole lot about, they've learned a lot about Tourette's since, since this point, but back then they didn't know a whole lot about it and it definitely wasn't something that teachers were prepared for. She thought I was just acting up and, and so she walks over to me and she goes, don't you ever do that again? And I was, uh, I couldn't help it and I was moving my head and she grabbed my head. To quit moving your head, you're a distraction to this class. So I learned to be the class clown. You, as, a, as a child, you learn how to deal with these things in ways you just don't know what you're, how to do it, but you, you try to, just it's human instinct to try to figure out what to do. So I became a class clown because I wanted my friends, to, I wanted friends and, and uh, but I, what I realized was I can get kicked out of the class and sit in the hallway and I can do whatever I need to do at that time and I can be at peace. So I started doing that and, and uh, went through a season in, in high school where I um, just started a party and I, I wanted friends and so I'd look for, for uh, you know, external appreciation or approval in my life. But I remember my eighth grade year. Eighth grade year. So my parents had taken me to the doctor and uh, just a regular doctor. And like I said, they didn't know a whole lot about Tourette's at this time. And so the, the doctor tells my mom, first of all, they gave me an, an antidepressant. I wasn't depressed, but, but I was, you know, I had this tick. Give me an antidepressant and then told my parents, just don't talk about it. It's, it's great advice, right, Scott? Just don't, if, he, if he's doing it, just ignore it, act like it's not happening. And so my Parents thought they were doing exactly what they were supposed to do, but we didn't talk about it as a family. And so what I would do is I would go home, I would leave school and I would try, like I said earlier, maybe you're walking around, you're keeping the chin up and you act like things are all right. And I would do that at school and then I would go home and I would sit in my room and I would weep. And I wanted so badly for this to be out of my head like where I could hide it. So I would, anytime I needed to, to twitch my face, I started twitching my stomach and I moved it. I moved it from my face to my stomach so I could hide. It actually became worse because then it affected my breathing. It affected my, 
inter, like internal organs to a degree. It just, it just really was, was not good. And so, um, so fast forward, I got a college soccer scholarship to Oral Roberts University. The interesting thing about this whole process was I was still like, had friends, I was, I was still, you know, I, I, I was captain of every team I was a part of. Um, and so it looked like to everybody else that things are great. And then college comes and I'm playing my freshman year and I got to start my freshman year of college. It was awesome. And so I'm carrying this weight as a college student of trying to figure out, you know, school and I walked out of a relationship and so that was difficult. And then I'm trying to balance soccer and then my coach just keeps using me for leadership stuff and I just felt stressed. And, and so the, the Tourette's got really, really bad my freshman year of college. So my mom drives up one night and says, uh, I made an appointment with a neurologist. And we're gonna go to the doctor. So we went to the doctor and the doctor walks in and I kind of show him the ticks that was going on and then he walks out, he was a husband and wife practice, so he walks out, gets his wife, his wife walks in, she looks out. I'm talking, they both looked at me for 30 seconds and then he just instantly, he just said, yeah, you have, he pointed right at me and he didn't mean this bad at all, I just, it, it's the way that it came off to me. He looked at me and said, yeah, you have, you have Tourette's syndrome. And now you would have think that that, you would have thought that, that was a breakthrough moment for me. Like, oh, finally, I've got it figured out. That was the moment that somebody looked at me and said, you feel different, you are different. I felt like a label was written and placed right here on my chest. And so I went through some serious depression. They put me on medication that would make me sleep so, I mean, it was just, it was terrible. I went through this season of, of depression and anxiety and, and uh, so one day, I decided I don't, I don't need to carry this like this. And I remember in the middle of the night at the apartment that I lived in at that time, it was probably two or three in the morning my roommate was asleep. And I walked out into my living room and I fell on my knees and I began to just pray, Lord, I got my Bible out. And I read 2 Corinthians 12, eight through 10. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake, I delight in my weaknesses and in insults. And I went back through all the insults that I've, I've faced it's like the Lord flooded me with all these reminders and the, of all those times, and I, I literally forgave them in that moment. And hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I believe. So I, I still, it's, it's much easier today. Tourette's the... the the tick is much easier. I've learned a lot of things about Tourette's. I've learned how to manage a lot of it with diet and all kinds of stuff. But at the end of the day, listen, I, I still believe that God's a healer. And God has healed me in many ways and different, but this, this is a particular area where it has not been taken away. So here's how my, 
my prayer has been sifted. It's been sifted that, Lord, I know you will take, take this away from me at some point, but as long as I have it, God, will you use it? And here's how God's used it. Over and over again in my life, as I've shared little stories of this, I've gotten to meet with these little boys who have Tourette's syndrome. And I've got to talk to them on the phone. And I've got to sit with them. And I said, listen, nobody else knows what you feel like, but I do. And I'm just telling you right now, you're gonna get through this. It was a season in my life, college, that I contemplated taking my life and I've gotten to give hope to kids that are facing what I faced. I've talked to adults, I've talked to parents, I've encouraged parents and the very fact that I even have Tourette syndrome, and, and, and I'm not saying this for me, this is Christ's power that rests on me. The fact that I would stand in front of you with a microphone in my hand with Tourette's is very, very rare. That's just not something those with Tourette's want to just hide. The fact that I'm, I'm standing here today is, is a testament of the power of God at work, but the thing that God has done the most through this process more than anything else, I've got to talk to kids, I've got to talk to parents, but at the end of the day, God has grown compassion in me. I believe I'm a pastor today because of the compassion I have for people who are hurting and who are in pain. And I'm, I'm telling you, you walked in with pain today, you walked in hurting, nobody knows it, you're going through difficulty. Let me just tell you something, I know of a God that brings hope and that hope's not just a little hope. That hope's a hope so full that you will overflow with hope that it begins to pour out on the people around you. So if you'll lay it down and you'll tell him, I am, I, listen, at the end of the day, I've, I've prayed, Lord, take it away. And if you don't, God will use it. Even if you don't, Lord, we'll use it. Even if the marriage doesn't get better, will you use it? Even if kids don't come back, will you use it? Even if finances don't get better, will you use it? Even if, even if, but here's what I know about God is I know that God cares about you, he loves you. He's got you right in his hand. Would you allow him to do the work? So people have asked me all the time, you know, if you could pray and, if you could just have done a different journey, would, it, would, you have take, would you have taken the different journey? And had I been presented with a different journey early on, I would have said, absolutely, take it away. But now that I've walked this journey, every single time, here's what I say, I would never, I would never trade what I've walked through. Because what I've walked through has made me the person I am, the pastor I am, the husband I am, and the Father that I am. So Lord, would you sift us? Would you sift our prayers? Would you do your work? Lord, we lay it down right now. For those of us carrying worry and anxiety, we lay it down. Father, for, for those of us that, that, that you're doing something in us, give us patience, give us a process. The process, allow us to be faithful. And, and in the waiting process, let us carry hope that our hope would not be stolen, and ultimately, God, I pray that this breakdown that we're experiencing would be used. So God, as long as it's going on, as long as we have it, God, would you use it? And we say, Lord, it is better your way. Even if it's difficult, you took the, the Israelites on a roundabout journey, even in the difficulty, Father, we say it's better your way, and we love you, and we worship you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us here today for this week's message. And here at Victory Church, we are called to equip people to live in His presence, move beyond ourselves, and be transformed. And this can only happen through your radical generosity, your serving, and your prayers. 
If this message or any of our messages have impacted your life and you would like to partner with us by giving into this ministry, you can do so by visiting our website at victory.church give. Thank you again for joining us and have a great day.